the best place to be. Amen. When we can hear from, see God. But what's wonderful too is that that because of, of, of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, right, we can see God and experience God anywhere. Amen? Amen. So we praise God for that. Also praise God today on this Sunday, the 15th of September. Man, September's kind of moving. Um, but we praise God for his word. And I'm going to ask you to turn with me today to Acts chapter 10. The book of Acts chapter 10. As um, I, be, I believe that God continues to call us to this place of simplicity in him. Amen. It's not complicated. Amen. God is God. We are his children. And we have all kinds of blessings and, and, and promises in his word that belong to us because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Amen. So it's up to us to be what we're called, and that is believers. Amen. We have to believe. Amen. And we are continuing to uh, allow God to build us up in our faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Amen. Uh, but we're in Acts chapter 10, and I'm going to ask you to look with me at verses 34 and 35. Verses 34 and 35, Acts chapter 10. And I'm reading from the King James Version, and it says this. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. Amen. We pray today. Father, we bless you for the word that has been read into our hearing. And Father, we thank you now for the presence of the Holy Spirit here with us who will lead us and guide us into the truth of your word. Father, you said the truth would make us free. Yes. And so, Father, we bless you right now that as we come to know the truth of your word, God, we will be set free from all of the snares and traps and, and, and tricks of the enemy, that we may walk in your divine purpose and will for our lives. Yes. Father, we bless you right now for your love being upon us. And Father, I just pray now that you will give us an understanding heart as we receive and hear your word on today. Let us walk in your revealed uh, will today. And Father, we thank you, God, for doing it. Father, God, I ask you now to use me for your glory as I submit to your authority. Yes. Have your way in the place, and may you and you alone be glorified in the eyes of the people. We bless you, we praise you, we honor you, Lord. We adore you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we just read Acts chapter 10, 34 to 35. I'm going to read it again. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. Amen. Our title today is God plays no favorites. Amen. God plays no favorites. Just have to open my water. Amen. Amen. Praise God for open water. Amen. Closed water is not good. Open water is a lot better. Amen. Amen. But our title today, Amen, God plays no favorites. God plays no favorites. And the Spirit of God leads me to this place today based on some of the things that we have seen in the news. And in particular, I, you know, this, I'm led here by what a lot of people are talking about as it relates to Felicity Huffman. Um, actress, rich, famous, who, with others, were involved in this college admissions scandal, which simply put, in various forms, you had rich people, and let's just be honest, rich white people, who were trying to game the system, using their position, their wealth, their power, in order to help their children, some of whom perhaps were not qualified to get into college. That's what they were doing. A number of them got arrested. 
including Felicity Huffman. And I guess, I don't know when it was, a day or two ago, um, she was sentenced uh, for her part in this, where you know she paid $15,000 to a proctor to uh, cheat on her daughter's SAT yes. exam. And you know the SAT exam is that standardized test that, among other things, is used to determine if you can get into school and if so, what schools you are eligible to get into. And so she paid $15,000 for a proctor to cheat on behalf of her daughter on the SAT exam. And uh, in, re in, in, as a consequence of that, she got 14 days in prison. Um, 250 hours of community service and had to pay a $30,000 fine. Now, immediately after this, social media went crazy, right? And, and people started talking about, God bless you, Tanya McDowell, who is the mother, I believe it was in Ohio, who in 2011 um, got, I believe, five years in prison because some people say it's because she used the wrong address to enroll her kid in school. Yeah. But what I understand, I think the case is a little bit more complicated than that because Tony McDowell, in, also in that same year, also tried to sell drugs to an undercover officer and got arrested for that too. And so she was facing a lot of time. She got convicted on the school charges and I believe as a way of coming to a deal, she got to five years, but she was facing a whole lot more than that. So to say it was five years for the school thing, I think is not quite accurate. At least that's my understanding. I think a more recent vintage though is the case of Crystal Mason. And the reason, and the reason why I'm saying these, these, these names is because I think sometimes we, we just say this woman, this man, this woman, this man. Take the time to understand that the person has a name. You know what I mean? Don't dehumanize them. This man in Ohio, this woman in Ohio, they have a name. Take time to learn their names. And so Crystal Mason in Texas is facing five years in prison because she improperly cast a provisional ballot in the 2016 election. And she was a, she was a convicted felon. She, was, she had been released or on supervised release for a 2011 tax fraud conviction and in Texas, a convicted felon cannot vote, or they're not allowed to vote until they finish out their full sentence. And she didn't. But she didn't know that, she didn't purposely go and knowingly go and vote knowing that she couldn't. She voted because she was out. And her vote wasn't counted, but yet the DA, for some reason, is like all crazy and, 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 and gung-ho on this. And, you know, they have sentenced her to five years. She's out on appeal now, but you know, five years for in, you know, unknowingly casting a ballot versus 14 days for knowingly trying to game the system and get your kid into college being found you know, up on charges of conspiracy to commit fraud and all other kind of charges, and you get two weeks. And you know, one guy was on social media and said, I can buy milk on the same day Felicity Huffman goes into jail and that milk will still be good wow. when she comes out. Just to show you the brevity of her sentence. And so a lot of people of all shapes and sizes and colors and, and what have you are, are upset because they see this unjustly. But here's the thing, these recent events for anyone who's been around and awake for a while, don't come as some news bullet. I mean, if you've been around for just a little while and are paying half uh, attention, you will know something. Our world, and particularly for us here in the United States of America, our society is anything but fair. You know, we have a saying in this country that justice is blind, but let me tell you something. Justice in this country is not blind. Justice in this country sees everything. Justice in this country sees color, 
justice in this country sees gender, justice in this country sees socioeconomic status, justice in this country sees whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're powerful, whether you're weak, whether you're educated, whether you're uneducated, whether you come from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks. Justice in this country is anything but blind because justice in this country sees everything. Yes. Which is why Felicity Huckman gets two years, which is why you know, a, a, a preppy uh, a young man out in California who rapes a woman gets off lightly. <laughs> because justice takes that kind of stuff, justice takes that kind of stuff into account. But as Christians, we can rejoice at something. We serve a God who's above all gods. And we serve a God who's above all men and all governments and all systems and everything else. And the God that we serve plays no favorites. This society may play favorites. And our systems, various systems, economic systems and justice systems and educational systems play favorites. But we serve a God in heaven who plays no favorites whatsoever. And we should be happy about that. In the, in the, in the text that we read today, Peter, in verse 34 of Acts 10, it says he opens his mouth and says, Of a truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons. And But before we can truly appreciate what he's saying here, we go back to the beginning of Acts 10. And there, in verse 1, we find a man named Cornelius, who is a centurion, which means he was part of the Roman army. He was the leader of a hundred men uh, who were under his command as part of the Roman army. So he was a Roman. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman. But we learn in, in, in verse 2 that he was a devout man, which means he had strong religious commitment. He was also, in verse 2 it says, he was a man that feared God. He reverenced God with all his house, which means he set the example for his household, and his household was following behind him in this example. And it says also that he gave much alms to the people, so we learn also that he was a generous man. And then lastly it said he prayed to God always, so he was a praying man. So he was a devout man, he was a man who feared God, who was an example in his house, he was a generous man who gave uh, to support others. And he was also a praying man. And so this Roman centurion who fits all of these things is praying unto God. But one thing we have to understand, right here, he doesn't know Jesus. But he's praying unto God. And God spoke to Cornelius in a vision and told him, to send some men unto Joppa and go summon Peter to come back to his house. Meanwhile, Peter himself, uh, he's staying at Simon the Tanner's house and he had a vision too. He was up on the roof uh, around noontime. He was hungry and he had a vision where he saw these unclean animals being lowered on a sheet from heaven. And he heard a voice saying, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, my Lord. I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And he heard a voice from God that said, that said what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. In other words, if I cleanse the thing, don't you dare call it unclean. And he had this, this thing was repeated three times unto him. And at this time, the men that Cornelius had sent had now arrived at the house. Peter, you know, goes with them and he goes back to Cornelius' house. And that's where we pick up with, with, with Peter in verse 34, because he comes into the house of this Gentile and he says, because Peter now got the point, he says, I perceive something. God is no respecter of persons. And what he meant by this, at this time, Jewish people believed they were the chosen ones. 
And they believed that God loved them more than he loved Gentiles. And that's why Peter was like, no, nah, I'm not even supposed to go to your house. But Peter went to Cornelius' house because God told him, if I cleanse a thing, don't you dare call it unclean. What I cleanse, that call not thou common. And so Peter says, I get it now. I get it. He says, I, I understand that God is no respecter of persons. And that word respecter, or the word that's translated respecter, comes from a Greek word that means to show favoritism or one who discriminates. And so when you see it says God is no respecter of person, it means God doesn't discriminate. God doesn't show favoritism. Some versions of the Bible may use the word partial or partiality, that God is not partial. God shows no partiality. So Unlike our society, God shows no favoritism. He has no favorites. He doesn't care what race you are, what ethnic, what, you know, what your ethnic background is, what your gender is, what your social standing is. He doesn't care if you're rich, you're poor, you're weak, you're strong. He doesn't care your language. He doesn't care about your looks. He doesn't care about your height. He doesn't care about your weight. It doesn't matter with God. We live in a society where people respond to us based on these external factors, but aren't you glad that there's a God in heaven who says, that's not how I operate. Amen. I don't operate based on that. I don't operate based on these external factors. Amen. But for a lot of people, they do. And in fact, even people in the household of faith are too often guilty of treating, and look, we gotta maybe include our own self in the number. How many times we make decisions and, 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 and come to conclusions based on what we see in somebody externally? God doesn't do that. People of God do that. People of God do that. Mm -hmm. Samuel did it. You remember? Remember when God told Samuel to go anoint the king that would take uh, Saul's place, and he and God led Samuel to Jesse's house, Jesse the father of David, and, and led him to Jesse's house. And the first uh, 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 David's oldest brother came out, I think his name was Eliab. And he came out, and he was tall like Saul was, because Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. And Eliab was tall like Saul. And, 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 and Samuel said, Surely this is God's anointing. And God said, No, nope, not him. Right? He said, don't be looking on his stature. Don't be looking about how tall he is. Don't look about how handsome he is. Don't look about how strong he may look. He says, he says, men look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So even people of God can be guilty of looking on the outside. How many of us have said, oh, Lord, that's me, amen? I've done that. Right. You've done that. We've done that. People of God sometimes do that, but we have to understand God doesn't want us doing that. Why? Because that's not how he operates. God doesn't, doesn't have favorites, and he doesn't want us acting that way either. In the book of James chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? And then in verse 9 it says, But if you favor some people over others, you are committing sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. God doesn't want us showing favoritism. Why? Because that's not where he comes from. God plays no favorites. Amen? God plays no favorites. And yet there are many who believe that God favors certain people over others, even in the body of Christ. Yeah. But he doesn't. Amen. He doesn't. This is one of the reasons why we have to be careful with some of the things we say in church, like she or he knows how to get a prayer through. 
Because some people may believe that the reason why he or she gets a prayer through is somehow because they're special. That somehow God views them differently than He views you and me. But 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 God shows no favoritism. And we need to understand that even in the body of Christ, because sometimes as because we're saved, we think God looks at the world the way we look at the world. Right. And you know, especially when you first get saved and you're all on fire for God, you start rejecting the things of the world. That's of the world. That's of the world. And you start getting, putting your nose up at the things of the world and at people who are in the world. They're in the world. <laughs> and you, you know, so you just want to be around people who are like you, who are in the body of Christ. They're in the world. But how many of you know the, the word of God says God so loved the world? Right. Right. God loves the world. Now, he doesn't want people who are standing on the outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ to stay there. But he loves them. Mm -hmm. I believe there are some Christians in the body of Christ who despise people who are in the world. That's right. I said it. You despise them. You look down on them. You put your spiritual nose up in the air at them. And yet the God who saved you loves them. And wants to save them too. Why? Because he plays no favorites. And that's what we see in Cornelius. Cornelius was not a Jew. And yet God, God, when, when Cornelius is praying unto him, not knowing Jesus Christ, so therefore he's on the outside of the family of God, God loved Cornelius enough that he set in motion and said, Go get Peter, and I'm going to have Peter come to your house. But first, I've got to convince Peter about his feelings about clean and unclean, about Jew and Gentile. I've got to change this boy's mind, but I'm going to do that. You just send some men over there, and then I'm going to tell Peter to come back with your men, and then he's going to tell you about Jesus and give you and your family an opportunity to accept Jesus so that I can save you too. Wow. Why? Because there's no favorites with God. God's not looking like, oh, I'm only going to save the Jews. No. And aren't you glad about it since you're not a Jew? Amen. I'm glad about it. Amen. And so he opened the door for Cornelius to get saved and for his household to get saved. Why? Because God, so God loves the world. He doesn't want any man to perish. Amen. So he, he went through all this in order to bring calling and sin. So as, as people of God, God doesn't want us being, uh, having favorites or putting up our spiritual noses at other people because see, that's how this world works. And God says, no, 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 that's, that's not how I work. And see, when we see the injustice of a Felicity Huffman, and we see the injustice of a Crystal Mason, and we see the injustice that goes on all around us because of race and class and all these other things, it, the reason why it bothers us is because it's wrong. It's wrong. Amen. But instead of talking about what's wrong, God is leading me here to teach, to, to, to say to you and share with you today about what's right. And what's right is the spirit of the God that we serve who said, I don't play any favors. And that is a reason for us to rejoice. Because if God plays no favors, then you need to understand it doesn't matter if you hold a position in the church or not. It doesn't matter if you are sitting on the stage in the church or you sitting at the, in, in, in the last pew. It doesn't matter if you're in ministry or if you're in, 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 in a mess. It doesn't matter. If you, if you approach God with a sincere heart, which is what Cornelius was doing, then God will respond to you and your position doesn't matter. How long you've been saved doesn't matter. In fact, if you're not saved, you can still call out to God. Cornelius wasn't saved. Yeah. Why? Because God plays no favorites. God plays no favorites. Now, this doesn't mean so he said, so, so, so I can do anything I want and God's going to did I say you can do anything you want? <laughs> no. All I said was God plays no favorites. I didn't say God didn't have any standards. <laughs> right. He still has standards. 
He still says, amen. He still says, for example, if you want to, amen, if you want to come into the household of faith, you have to accept his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lord of your life. Amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, amen, no one comes to the Father, what? But by me. Mm -hmm. God has standards. He has standards of holiness. He has standards of righteousness. He has standards of love. He has standards, amen. God has, has standards, but he doesn't play favorites. Now watch this. We can get a sense of this if we go to Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25, we see there a familiar, a familiar story about uh, Jesus told the story about the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. And you look in verse 14 and it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. And so we see here, God, he gave, amen, this is a parable about the Lord, amen, and how he gave one man five talents, another man two talents, another man one. But the key part of this scripture says, according to, to his several ability, to every man. So in other words, God has standards, but he's going to treat people on how they live up to their standards according to their ability to do so. What do I mean? Because you go back and you go in this, in this, in this, in this scripture, right? <clears throat> to the one he gave five, that man gave another five. And he said, what? Well done, that good faithful servant. The other man he gave two, he gave another two. He said, well done to that one too. Right? The other one had one and he kept it and hid it under a napkin and said, I was afraid and all this other thing. And God said, you wicked and slothful servant. Mm -hmm. He wasn't, he, listen, God didn't expect the man who had two to give him another five. Right. Because that man's ability was to get another two. Yes. He didn't expect the man who he gave five to bring him back another 15 because that man's ability was to give five. But the standard was, I expect you to be productive. I don't expect you to sit on your, the, right, be, and, and, and I think it's in Luke where the, the, the parable says, occupy till I come. In other words, you be occupied in, in kingdom business. The, and, the, and the standard was, you need to be productive. How many of you know God wants us to be productive? Right. He doesn't give us talents and gifts and abilities and resources and expect us to sit on it like that servant who had won and didn't do anything with it. That servant didn't meet the standard. But God had, he, he gave one five, he gave another one two, he gave another one one based on their individual ability. So understand that God has a standard, but listen, if you've been saved 30 years, God may expect you to believe him he expects all of us to believe him. But if you've been saved 30 years, he may have more of an expectation on you walking in belief to something he says than to somebody who's been saved for 30 minutes. Right? Yeah. right? Because that ability is not quite there yet. That, that, that baby Christian hasn't grown up yet. They still need some teaching. They still need some nurturing. They still need some ministering. But if you've been walking with God for 30 years, how, how many of you know he doesn't change the standard for you? The standard is still you need to believe me. But he expects you to believe him according to your ability that should have been refined and be mature because you've been walking with him longer. What's the point? The point is this. There are people today, and I'm going to start with the body of Christ. There are people today in the body of Christ who are depressed and they're dejected because they believe that God will not hear them or respond to them because of their because of their person or because of their position. Yeah. And God wants you to know that is simply not true. Doesn't matter. God's not looking at your position. He's not. He's not looking at your person. And even if people in your church treat you that way, God wants you to know he sits high and he's not treating you that way. He's not looking at you and, and, and saying that you're not worthy. God says to his children, come boldly before the throne of grace. 
And he doesn't just say those who are educated and, and, or those who are well versed in the scripture or those who've been in church for this amount of time. Listen, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the invitation is open to you. You can come boldly unto me and ask me what you will. Right? Ask me what you will. Now, you, as you grow, you understand you, you have to ask according to his will. But that comes as you start to grow up in him. But the bottom line is God is ready to hear you and your position doesn't matter. Don't believe for a moment that somehow, that somehow God is showing favors to, to this one over that one. His standards are the same. But he may be looking for you to live up to the standard based on your ability to do so. But it's not your person. God's not going to discriminate against you because you're not in ministry. God's not going to listen to somebody else's prayer simply because they have a title in front of their name. Their missionary, their deacon, their bishop, their pastor, their first lady. That doesn't, that doesn't move God. What moves God is the sincerity of your heart. Isn't that what the writer of Hebrews says? That God is a rewarder of those who diligently or sincerely seek him. Not your position. So someone today who believes that God will not hear you because of your position, God wants you to know, I play no favorites. Don't stay away from me because you think you're not worthy. Because here's the thing, praise be unto God, none of us are worthy. Amen. Huh. And the minute you understand you're not worthy and you resolve that and you know that, it, but, but, but that through Christ, he's the one who's worthy and it's through him that you can come to God, then all the pressure is off you. No, I'm not worthy. You think you're good enough to come to God? No, that's the, that's, the, that's the blessing of grace. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. Neither are you. Amen. But God's playing no favorites. He's not going to hear bishop so-and-so or pastor so-and-so, but not hear you simply because you don't have a position. He's not going to hear this one because they, they put more money in the offering plate than you do. They have more resources than you. Yeah. So the rich man in church, the rich woman in church who, you know, $100, fine, put your $100 in. But if you can only put in a dollar or you can only put in a dime, don't think that somehow God is only going to let's give you 10 cents worth. But give them $100 worth. That's not how God works. He's not moved by economics. The society is, but our God isn't. So, so don't, don't, don't. Be encouraged and understand. God will hear you. You can be the lowest person on, on the totem pole, but if your heart is right toward God, God will hear you. And for those who think that your position somehow puts you in better stead with God than other people, you need to get a dose of reality. That's not how God works. Praise be unto God you went to seminary. But if you think that that and that alone brings you closer to God, then you don't understand the God you serve. Amen. Amen. God is not moved by titles. God shows no favorites. Amen. None. And so for those especially who are dejected and depressed today, but you think God won't hear you, God wants you to know, I'll hear you. Just come to me with a pure heart. <laughs> I'll hear you quick, fast, and in a hurry. Yes. Amen. I'll hear you quick, fast, and in a hurry if you have a right heart. Because that's what I'm looking at. I'm not looking at prestige. I'm not looking at position. I'm not looking at money. I'm not looking at what kind of house you come from, what kind of education you got. I'm not looking at any of that. This world does that. I don't operate that way, says God. I'm not looking at any of that. So don't, don't, don't put that on yourself because God's not putting that on you. There are other people, amen, who, who need to be encouraged by this because they suffer from the little old me syndrome. I've heard people say, you know, you know, God won't concern himself with someone like me. What? That's not true. Amen. That's just simply not true. God loves the world. God loves you. And so it's not a matter of your station in life. 
I believe something by faith, amen, and I praise God for just speaking into my spirit. That, 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 that God really is, listen, there has been in the church too much of an emphasis on position. Yes. Especially in the black church. I remember there was a big, there was a big move years ago where everybody was becoming a doctor. Everybody became Dr. Smith and, and Dr. Jones and Dr. Williams and Dr. 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 This. And we were so concerned about the title Doctor, Apostle. You know, you see people like that. I'm Apostle so and so. I'm Apostle so and so. <laughs> I don't care where I go. If I meet somebody and they say who you are, I don't care if the church says, you know what I tell them my name is? Jeff. <laughs> Why? Because that's what my mama named me. <laughs> Amen. My mama didn't name me minister. My mama didn't name me pastor. My mama didn't name my mama named me Jeff. You look at my birth certificate, that is what you will see. You look at my driver's license, that is what you see. You look on the deed of my house, that is what you see. You will not see. Pastor this, minister this, bishop this, missionary that. See, those are all titles that really outside the church. Right. Don't even have any significance. You think you can go in the bank and you're going to get more favorable terms on your loan because you tell them you missionary Jones? No. But you expect, come on, someone. Man doesn't even give you that. But God's supposed to, no. And this is not to try to put down titles and attainment. That's not the point. The point is God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't show favoritism based on your station in life, whether high or low. Amen. He's not going to discriminate against those who haven't achieved positions. That's not how he works. And that's a liberating thing for those who believe that somehow they're on the outside looking in. And I want you to know, you're not on the outside looking in. Amen. You're in good position to look up to heaven with a pure heart and hear from God. Isn't that the story of the Pharisee and, 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 and the other man? I forget what he was, but didn't Jesus tell the story about the Pharisee? who was praying unto God, and he looked up to heaven, and I'm glad I'm not like him. Mm -hmm. Right? You remember that parable? And it said that the other man, he was so humble, he wouldn't even lift up his eyes unto God. But his heart was right. And Jesus said, I'm telling you this, God heard that man yeah. more than he heard that Pharisee, the religious leader. He had a position. He had a title. And Jesus said, God heard him, the one with no title, but the one who had the right heart. Glory to God. Somebody needs to know right now, God hears me. And God is ready to hear from me, even if, if I'm just little old me. God he doesn't care about your title. Amen. That's why, look, I take after God. Isn't that what the scripture said? Mm -hmm. That you should be imitators of God as dear children. Mm -hmm. So I take after God. So know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. If God don't care about your title, <laughs> I don't either. And it's no disrespect. But what I'm saying is I'm not moved by that. Because my God is not moved by that. And I want to take after him. And so you can call me what you want. You can say, oh, Pastor, I'm not even moved by that. I'm not moved by what you call me. I'm, I'm not moved. Why? Because titles don't matter. Not when it all comes down to it. And God is not looking at whether or not you have a title and in in, in, in deciding whether he's going to listen to your voice, hear you, respond to you, bless you. And aren't you glad about it? I know I am. Yes. I know I am. 
I'm glad about it. I'm glad that God is not, 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 not holding me to the standards of how society does things and making decisions of how society does it because society looks at all these external factors and decides whether or not you should get preferential treatment or not. But our God doesn't do that. Here's the bottom line. If you and I believe God, we can receive from God. Position don't matter. Amen. Praise be unto God for that. I don't need to be high polluting. I don't need to, to go up higher in life. I don't need and, and, and listen, do you understand that if we would get this, that, that some of this crap in the barrel mentality would stop? <laughs> some of us don't want other people to get up higher, but we think somehow that's gonna lead them to have more faith. Why are you scrambling to keep Jimmy from going higher? Why are you scrambling for, from, from trying to keep Jenny from going higher? There's someone who's down there who's not scrambling is getting blessed by God because they're not chasing behind positions and titles and, and all these uh, achievements and all those other things. They just simply love the Lord. Amen. Amen. So if we believe God, we'll receive from God. Amen. If we, if we believe God, if our heart is right toward God, God said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's what he said. He said, you seek me and find me if you go to seminary. You'll seek me and find me if you go to college. You'll seek me and find me if you get involved in the ministry. You'll seek me and find me if, if you become a leader in, in the church. He didn't say any of that. Amen. He said, you will seek me and find me if you search for me with all your heart. On somebody. God shows no favorites. I'm so glad about that. And I'm so glad to, to, to just simply say that because someone, amen, you know, you need to be set free from this idea that somehow you were on the outside looking in. And I'm telling you now, you've always been on the inside. From the time you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you became an inside man. You became an inside woman. You on the inside. Amen. You know, you know, you know what they say about inside man. You know what inside man mean? Inside man mean you got some secrets or you got some information. Amen. That the only way you got it is because you're on the inside. When they call you an inside man in, in society, that's a bad thing. You're an inside man. You're an inside man because you got some inside insider trading. What does that mean? That means you you were you had access to some information on the inside that the rest of the world didn't have, and you used it to your advantage. But I want to let you know, there's such a thing as an inside man in the kingdom of God. It's not a bad thing. You want to be an inside man, but the minute you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are no longer on the outside. You are now on the inside, and you can go unto God and have the advantage over those who don't know God. There's an advantage to knowing God. This, the Bible talks about that. In the book of Galatians, it talks about those who, who, who were without God in this world. They were without hope in this world. They don't know God. They were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. But when you become part of the, uh, of the family of God, God so starts sharing some stuff with you. He gives you God ideas. He gives you witty inventions. He gives you revelation and insight. He shows you stuff. He even tells you sometimes, don't even worry about what you're going to say. I'll, the Holy Spirit will give you the words you need at the appropriate time. You have advantages. So don't think for a moment that you're a disadvantage, amen? Because you don't have stature. Forget stature, amen? amen. Forget stature. You go into God with boldness like you belong to be there because you do. because Not because of you, but because of the Christ in you. Amen? Amen. So if you and I believe God, we will receive from God. If we seek God with all our heart, God said, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you search for me with all your heart. So just remember this. Many years ago, there was, as we saw here in Acts, a Roman military official who had no relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. But he was devout. He had religious commitment. He feared God. 
He was a leader in his household. He was generous with the resources God has given him. And he was a praying man. And even though he didn't know Jesus Christ, he was reaching out to God and God then started moving some things and orchestrating some things so that that man could hear the good news of Jesus Christ and, and had Peter come to his house to share the gospel. And because he heard the word and accepted the word that Jesus Christ is Lord, he became saved. Yes. God heard him. He's on the outside. Physician be darned. Amen. So if you're on the outside now, please understand something. God will hear you if you have a sincere heart. Amen? Amen. And he'll see to it, right? That's why Jesus said, pray the Lord in the harvest that he will send forth laborers. Right? There are laborers that God will send to you and those who are on the outside if you have a sincere heart. So, and how, listen, how did you get on the inside? Okay. Same thing. At some point, you were crying out to God. You were crying out to God because you reached the lowest low. You were crying out to God because you were in a, in a gutter with drug addiction. You cried out to God because your marriage went completely. You were crying out to God because you went into bankruptcy. You were crying out to God because you lost your job. You were crying out to God because people started treating you like a dirty dog. At some point, all of us got to a point where we were on the outside and we started crying out to God. And God, if it was about position, he would have never heard you. He would have never heard me. Yes. God loves the world. No favoritism. Standards, yes. That's not favoritism. Because he holds everybody to the same thing. Right. right? He doesn't say holiness for you, but you, yeah, you can be, <laughs> you can do what you want. <laughs> he doesn't say to you, you better love, but you, man, you, can, you can get, you know, don't worry about it. Amen. <laughs> no. Same standard. Same standard. According to your several ability. Right? That doesn't seem right. What are you talking about that doesn't seem right? 30 years, 30 minutes. Who do you think? Do you think everybody should be treated the same? That they should know the same? What did Jesus say? To whom much is given, much is required. Much is required. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're in a different, right? You're in a different position that way in terms of what you know and what you have. But the standard is still the same. Standard is productivity. Standard is love. Standard is honesty. Right. Standard is compassion. Standard is holiness. Same standard. But if you're on the outside and you have a sincere heart like Cornelius, God will see to it. He'll send a laborer over to you to share the word of God. Then you can now come into the family of God. Aren't we all God's children? No. But you're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's Bible. Galatians 3 and 26. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jesus is the key being part of the family, amen. But if you are part of the family, you really need to know something. Your position don't matter. What happens when it comes to whether or not God's going to hear you, or God's going to bless you, or God's going to, you know, be compassionate towards you. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Okay. You can get a prayer through too if your heart is right toward God and you're earnest in your prayers. You can get a prayer through too. You can hear from God too. Amen. I'm not saying it like Miriam and Aaron said. <laughs> they said out of jealousy. They said to Moses, you the only one to hear from God. <laughs> we can hear from him too. See, they had the wrong heart. I'm saying it from a heart of, of liberty because somebody believes you can't hear from God. And I'm telling you the devil is a liar. You can hear from God. Your position doesn't matter. And so here's the thing. If you open up your heart unto God, if you are just sincere and have a purity of heart and spirit unto God, doesn't mean you're perfect, but if you just have that, that, that pure heart toward God and you just want to be close to God and you just want to know what His will is and you just want to live a life that's pleasing in, in His sight and a life that gives Him glory, if you just want to show forth His goodness in the earth, if you just, that's where your heart is coming from. 
And you need to understand that you can call out to him boldly because you have that invitation. You can call out to him in faith. You can call out to him with expectation. And you can call out knowing this. He will hear you. Yes. Amen. And he'll answer you. Because God doesn't play this favorite game. Amen. Amen. He doesn't play this favorite game. And so here's the thing. As we, as we, you know, uh, you know, get all mad and stuff. I'm not saying we shouldn't get mad at the injustice, because injustice makes me upset too. And I think, it, I believe that I'm coming to understand a bit better that the reason why injustice and unfairness, I believe, makes me upset, it makes many of you upset, especially if you're in the body of Christ, is because the Spirit of God that's in you has no, there's nothing about the Spirit of God that is that shows partiality. And so when you see it, it just goes against everything in your spirit. But as you understand that though, understand that God is not going to show partiality either and rejoice in that. You know what I mean? Sometimes we get we, we spend so much time getting mad at the world because it's unfair. But we don't understand that God is not that way and we don't rejoice in that. And I'm saying to you that we need to rejoice in the fact that we serve a God who's not, you know, partial and doesn't discriminate and shows has no respect of persons and shows no favoritism. That means he's going to accept me as much as he accepts you and as much as he accepts this one, even if you are a higher station in life than I am. I'm rejoicing over that. Amen. Amen. I'm rejoicing over that. And I pray you rejoice over it too. But more than just rejoicing, take advantage of it. I don't say that in a bad way. When I say take advantage of it, meaning in other words, don't frustrate the grace of God by not doing it and just railing at the world, but not lifting up your hands unto the God of heaven and saying, oh God, I'm so grateful you don't treat me like that. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I pray that someone is, is, is encouraged today to say, you know what? God's ready to hear me. Amen. And that your faith is renewed and, and you're ready to go unto him and let your prayers be known and everything else and begin receiving from God all the great things he has for you. Amen. 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 Let's rest on our feet today. Amen. We pray to this wonderful God. This God who doesn't discriminate. Amen. 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 I'm so glad. Amen. This is society discriminates on all kinds of things. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're too dark. You're too light. Your accent is too thick. Isn't that crazy? This is, man. I thank God he's not like that. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Father, we bless your name, oh God. Hallelujah. We give you praise. Father, we thank you, God, that you are no respecter of persons. That God, that you do not show partiality, you show no favoritism, yes. you play no favorites. God, we thank you, God, that you have a standard and you have standards. But God, we thank you, God, that you look upon us and you look at the quality of our hearts. And Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that, that those who have been thinking, oh God, that somehow they were unworthy, that somehow because of their station in life, that Somehow they didn't matter. I pray, God, that that lie has been put to rest yes. and replaced by the truth that you love them and that you are ready to hear from them if they sincerely and earnestly call upon you yes. out of a pure heart. Father, I thank you, God, your word again. You will seek me and find me if you search for me with all your heart. Yes. I'm praying today, God, that everyone under the sound of my voice, whether they're in the body of Christ at the moment or not, I pray, oh God, that they will earnestly seek you with all their heart. And yes. Father, if they're on the outside, I pray, God, that you will send forth laborers, oh God, that Father will share the word, the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father God, that upon hearing that word, that they will receive that word with gladness and with joy and yes. make Jesus the Lord of their lives. For those who are in the body right now, God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that, Father, they will put down once and for all this notion that their position, their stature, or any external thing somehow determines whether you will hear their voice. Father, I thank you right now that they know the truth, 
That, Father, that you stand ready to hear them as they come before you in faith. And, Father God, that you will answer their prayer, oh God, simply because of the heart that they have for you. Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus Christ that you are our God. I thank you, God, for this word that you shared with us. And I'm praying, oh God, that there will be transformation and change taking place both now and in the days ahead. Father, we give you praise, glory, and honor for what you have spoken into our hearts because we believe it is a word of liberty. And Father, we receive it now by faith and we bless you for it. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen.